Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is March 20th, 2020, and this is video 24 in my series, The Mystery of the Beast. This video is called The Day of Wrath, and it may be that this is the last video in this series. We'll just see how the Lord leads. But this one is called The Day of Wrath. We have a lot to get through today, so let's get right into it. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus was tempted by Satan. Right after his 40-day temptation, he began his ministry. And he returned to Nazareth, the city where he had been brought up. And this is in Luke chapter 4, verse 16. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, have you ever bothered to go back to the book of Isaiah that he read from and find the scripture? It's very interesting. Before we go there, though, I, I will just remark that immediately the people reject Jesus, and this is really what happens the first time that Jesus came to earth. He was rejected by men. But he spoke from Isaiah chapter 61, and he ended with this phrase, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Okay, this was the year of the Lord's favor that he was speaking to the people at Nazareth but they rejected his favor. Favor is grace. And the question is, have we accepted or have we rejected God's grace, God's favor? In Isaiah 61, begins with this. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And that's where Jesus end, ended when he spoke to the people at Nazareth. But it goes on. And the day of vengeance of our God. That is the day of wrath. The day of wrath was not close at the time that Jesus spoke to these people. Let's go on and read a few more verses here. So Jesus came to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and as Isaiah goes on, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. First, let me say, when you read your Bible and you see a quote from the Old Testament, you need to go back and find where that quote is from and then read it and then read the context in order to understand what the Lord may be saying. When you do that over a long period of time, and you continue to do that, God is going to reveal to you many hidden things in his word, things that are, are not generally understood. Look at this, for example, in Isaiah 61. At the very beginning of 61, we have the beginning of Christ's ministry up to the very beginning of verse 2. But then suddenly it jumps to the time that we're in right now, the day of vengeance, the day of wrath. And then what happens? 
God is going to comfort those who mourn. That really is all of the people of God who have mourned for his coming. And he's going to grant them certain things, beautiful headdress, gladness, garment of praise, that they may be called oaks of righteousness. They are going to become fruitful trees in the earth that will bear fruit each month. Each month, they're going to have special fruit that comes forth for the people of God. We learn that in Revelation, the book of Revelation, chapters 21 and 22. And what are they going to do? These oaks of righteousness, they come, they are the planting of the Lord, that the Lord may be glorified. The scripture says that God is glorified in his kodeshim. And the word that the scriptures usually use is saints for the word kodeshim. God is glorified in his saints. A saint is a holy one. A true saint is a holy one in one of the kodeshim. They, the kodeshim, will build up the ancient ruins They will raise up the former devastations. They will repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. This is where we are today. We are living in a ruined earth. We are living in a world that is full of ancient ruins, full of devastations. We have ruined cities everywhere. We have the devastations of many generations. And now... The time has come. The time has come when our God is going to glorify the Kodeshim. He is going to make them oaks in the land. He's going to raise up a mountain. The mountain is the government of God that consists of the Kodeshim. They are going to soon be raised up. But we need to understand what this time looks like looks like right now, doesn't it? Have you ever seen anything in your lifetime happen like what's happening now? I don't think so. Let me just go to something I I recently got from uh, Project Veritas. I get letters from uh, Project Veritas often. The COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic that apparently started in Wuhan, China, has absolutely consumed global dialogue, and Project Veritas is committed to finding out the truth about what is going on worldwide surrounding the virus. Project Veritas is looking to speak with sources on the ground. If you or anyone you know work within the following industries, please contact us. If you have information the public should know about virus testing, hospitals, airports, cruise lines, ports of entry, local, state, federal government, law enforcement agencies, EMS, first responders, stock exchanges, financial industry, big pharma, mainstream media, big tech, sports and entertainment, etc. We need you. The world needs you. Why? Because we want to understand what's going on. We've never seen the United States shut down like it is shut down now. Or countries of the world shut down as they are shut down now. Why is this happening? What's going on? What is the, This is not business as usual. What we are seeing now is the beginning of the day of wrath. Remember, President Trump, shortly after he was inaugurated, said that this is the calm before the storm. We are now in the storm. We don't yet know who all the players are. We don't know all the players that we can trust. But we have now entered the storm. Now I'm going to read you some scriptures that... Second Thessalonians, I've gone over with you before. The man of lawlessness has been revealed. We know that when the man of lawlessness, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, 
not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. The rebellion is the divorcement. The rebellion is an event that I have described as the beast divorcing itself from Babylon the Great. Okay, When that happened, the man of lawlessness was revealed. We have never ever seen lawlessness like we saw recently with the impeachment of Donald Trump. The Democrats who led that were completely above the law. They didn't go by any standard of law. They did not go by due process or equal rights under the law. Trump had no rights. There was no due process for Donald Trump in the Democrat-led House of Representatives. The man of lawlessness is still being revealed daily with the constant attacks that we see coming against Donald Trump. But as, and I support Trump, and you know that. But as I've said before, we do not blindly support and worship Donald Trump. And th- this is what I want to get to today after one more verse I want to go to. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Again, Paul is talking about the day of the Lord. Oh, by the way, going back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Since we have had the rebellion come, we have had the great divorcement come, we have had the great apostasy, the breaking away of the beast and Babylon the great, now the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ can occur. Can occur. We are now in the time where we know that can happen. So, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. It's still going to be a surprise to most people. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. In the scripture, we find that destruction is a word that God uses when people come to know him, when their entire world is destroyed with respect to the way they've always lived. They've always served Satan. They've always served the ways of Satan. But sudden destruction will come upon them like labor pains, Labor pains, one of the common words you see with respect to this time that we live in, with respect to the time of the coming of Jesus Christ. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. You who are listening will, are not in darkness. You will, be, you will not be surprised. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us... Not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. That's the key. Do you wear the breastplate of faith? Quickly going back to Hebrews, book of Hebrews, Incredible book. I call it the book of the Kodeshim because it's a book for the people, for the church of the firstborn. And the firstborn in scripture are the Kodeshim. And many war- there are many warnings in the book of Hebrews. The first uh, four chapters includes at least six distinct warnings. And also in verse, in chapters 3 and 4, the warning of hearing God's voice. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion. We need to keep a, a soft, pliable heart before the Lord so that we do not become hardened, hardened by sin and by deceit. 
But the other day I was reading through this and, and the Lord showed me a really interesting, uh, excuse me. Well, I think that was a divine appointment so that I would focus a little more time on this uh, chapter of scripture than I was planning to. We're in Hebrews chapter four. And with respect to the scripture today, if you hear God's voice, it deals with the idea of coming into God's rest. And starting in verse 6 of chapter 4, since therefore it remains for some to enter it, that is, for some people to actually enter into God's rest, and those who formerly received the good news, the gospel, failed to enter because of disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain day called today, saying through David so long afterward, in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Now, I want to draw your attention to this. They heard the good news. Isn't that interesting? At the time of Moses, the people of Israel who came out of Egypt heard the good news. They heard the gospel. The gospel was preached to them, even though that seems hard to believe since Moses was the one who brought forth the law of God. Well, let's go on. Verse 8, for if Joshua had given them rest, remember right after Moses died, Joshua then led the people of Israel into the promised land, into Canaan. But yet they never came to rest there. That is a picture in type. Coming into the land is a picture of us coming into our glorified bodies. If Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his, from his own. That's a key for us. We need to learn to rest from our own works. So much of what we see done in the Christian world is simply a work of the flesh. It's um, man coming up with his own ideas about what he thinks is the best way for getting the gospel to the people or getting what they perceive to be the truth of God to the people. And so they enter into a whole lot of dead works. But here are what we're being told is that we need to rest from our own works. We need to come to the place where we only do what we see our Father doing, that we only, like Jesus did. Jesus said, I only do what I see my Father doing. Uh, again, when he was chastised for his teachings, he would say, my teaching is not my own. I only say what the Father says. And we need to be the same way. We need, you know, if we're wrong about something, and we are all, wrong about things. When we learn that we're wrong, we need to be free to say, hey, I was wrong about that particular idea. You know, don't get stuck in your doctrine continuing to teach false doctrine just because you've always taught it and you don't want people to think that uh, you didn't know what you were talking about. That's ridiculous. You know, my doctrine has changed over the years. I have grown over the years, God has taught me precept upon precept, line upon line. So we need to rest from our own works. Let us, therefore, strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Isn't it interesting? God wants us to come into rest. You know, rest is rest. And he says, strive to enter that rest. Well, it seems like that's almost making no sense at all. You know, work, strive to get into your rest. Well, how do we do that? Now he's going to tell us, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, 
See, this is the key for us, soul and spirit. This is what most teachers of the Bible do not understand. God has saved our spirits. Every man's spirit is saved by the redemption of Jesus Christ. And that's why it says Jesus went and preached to the spirits who were in prison. Their spirits were still in prison because they didn't know the truth. Jesus went and then he led them away from captivity with him. We need to be focusing on our soul. What the Bible spends its time talking about is the salvation of the soul way more than the salvation of the spirit because it's that's our mind, our will, and our emotions. We need to be renewed in our minds. Our minds are filled with the ways of the world, and we have to be renewed in our minds. And it's the Word of God that does that. That is the washing of the Word. That's why it's so important to stay in the Word, why it's important to read the Word, why it's important to listen to videos like this of people who understand some things of the Word of God so that you can be washed with the Word. And then you understand that there is a division of soul and of spirit. It's like, and then he goes on, like a knife cutting through joints and marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That's what the Word of God does. And no creature is hidden from his sight but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Now here next is where suddenly I came to a, a verse that I did not have underlined or highlighted or a note by. And let me just show you my chapters 3 and 4 of the book of Hebrews. Um, it's filled with all kinds of notes and highlights and comments, but I did not have verse 14 highlighted. Since then we have a high, a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. So here the writer of Hebrews, who I do not believe was Paul, I believe it was someone else, and it was not one of the original apostles, but the writer of Hebrews says, after he gives all kinds of warnings about paying attention to the things we hear, you know, and you would think, oh man, I've just got to be, I've got to be so perfect. Um, you know, I, I can't do this wrong. I can't do that wrong and so on. And so we put ourselves under law to be perfect by the law. And we think that, well, that's how we're going to escape all these warnings. But no, it's this simple. Let us hold fast our confession. Our confession. What is your confession? Remember, I've said this several times in these videos. Isaiah chapter 8. To the law and to the testimony. If you do not speak according to the, these things, the law and the testimony, it is because there is no light in you. That is our confession. And then what does Revelation 19 say? The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. Our confession is our testimony. And we see that again in Revelation chapter 12. Revelation 12, 11 says, And they have overcome him, the dragon, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their souls unto death. And that death is 
course, it can relate to dying physically, but it's also the death, death to the things of the world. Love not your souls unto the death, your death to the things of the world. Don't focus on the things of the world. And so when I saw this then, that this was the key, let us hold fast our confession, then suddenly the Spirit stirred up this scripture from Galatians 3. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Remember, the Galatians are wanting now to put themselves back under the law. They have these people called the Judaizers that want to put people back under the law. And so Paul is saying, don't submit to their laws. Verse 3, are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? See, that's where people are getting into such confusion these days with the Hebrew Roots movement. You know, I, I love the law. I love God's law. And it teaches us wonderful things. Many wise things. But yet, we don't understand we don't try to understand more and more of the minute aspects of the law so that i can then go and wear clothing with tassels or shave my beard in a certain way uh, or even eat a certain way i am free to eat whatever food i want to eat i can eat pork i can eat shrimp i can eat catfish even though under the law, those are forbidden foods. I can celebrate the Sabbath any day that I want. Of course, I think the day, God's Sabbath day, is Saturday, but most churches take their Sabbath on Sunday, and that's fine. Me, I might take it Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Usually I take it Sunday. Stores are open on Saturday, and I have a farm, and I have to buy things at a hardware store and uh, a ranch, a feed store sometimes. So, you know, for me, I'm free to have my Sabbath on Sunday, and I think taking a Sabbath day is a great thing. But if my cow falls into a pit on Sunday, then I'm going to go get it out, and I'm not going to worry about breaking the Sabbath but I always try to take at least 24 hours a, a week off for a Sabbath. Understand, we are not being perfected by the law. We are being perfected by the work of the Spirit in us. But you can test yourself. Is the Spirit working in you? Do you long for God's holiness? Do you want to be righteous like God is righteous? If you sin, do you mourn over your sin? That's what Jesus is talking about when he says, blessed are they who mourn in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. He's not talking about people whose loved one has just died. He's talking about mourning over the condition of our flesh. Blessed are they who mourn. Okay, now I took a detour, but I was in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, right around here. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. In other words, today if you hear God's voice, do not harden your heart. Be awake, be sober, be listening for the Spirit. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, to the light, to the truth, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. See, this breastplate of faith, that breastplate of faith is this. 
Let us hold fast our confession, your confession of faith, to the law and to the testimony, to the truth and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, for God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. God has not destined us for wrath. That's why I'm here in the scripture, because this video concerns the day of wrath. We have entered the day of wrath. Notice how almost everything is shut down right now. People cannot go and do all of the things that they used to do, all of the worldly things, going to the bars, going to the strip clubs, going to the uh, gambling houses, going to the sports events, on and on, not even out to eat. You can't even go out to eat. Now, we are, I live in uh, South Central Missouri, and uh, my neighboring county, the county commissioners just issued an order that shuts down all of the restaurants from any indoor eating. The only thing you can get is takeout. All gatherings of over 50 people have been prohibited. So we are seeing the shutdown of our society. We're seeing the shutdown of all of the things that the world loves to do. And yeah, we partake of some of those things and some of those things are not wrong to partake of, but some of them are wrong to partake of and we need to be discerning concerning what we do partake of. So, we need to understand that God has not destined us for wrath. Now, much of what I've taught with respect to the mystery of the beast and the identity of the eighth head of the beast being Donald Trump has come from the book of Revelation. Now let's look at Revelation chapter 14. Much of what I've spoken has come from Revelation 12, 13, 17, and 18. Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. The 144,000 are the Kodeshim. That is their number. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. Only the 144,000 know this song. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. Now it's interesting that we see the Kodeshim introduced here because now we're going to come into a description of the day of wrath. But I want to spend a little time here, a little more. Notice that these Kodeshim are the first fruits for God and the Lamb. These are the members of the church of the firstborn that we see in the book of Hebrews chapter 13. The... Um, The 144,000 are the first people who will ever be glorified, who will 
receive the fullness of the glory of God and will be like our God. They have an incredibly important role to play in what is about to happen. They sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. They know both mercy and truth. The song of the Lamb is mercy. Truth is the song of Moses. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead and an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. They are the ones who bring the gospel, the new covenant, to all the earth. And it's through them that the waters, that the, that the truth will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And the angel said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. And another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. In Revelation 17, we see the beast, the eighth head of the beast, turn against Babylon the Great because God has put it into his heart to destroy Babylon the Great. And then in Revelation chapter 18, we see the destruction of Babylon the Great described. Here, we see the declaration that Babylon the Great is fallen. And then we see this, another angel, a third, followed them saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. Here is a call for the endurance of the Kodeshim, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Unfortunately, it seems that a lot of Christians are, in a sense, worshiping Donald Trump. We have to be very careful that we don't do that. We honor him. He is the president that God has raised up. We need to respect him and we need to respect what God is doing through him. But he is not our example with respect to the ways of God. We need to be before God to understand what his ways are. And so we do not take the mark of the beast. We don't worship the beast. And we don't take the mark of the beast. We do not do the things that the beast, which is man, does. The mark of the beast on our hand, the things that we do, or in our head, the things that we think. We do not think and do the things of unredeemed man or fleshly man. The man of flesh. The beast is fleshly man. The man of flesh. We're not going to complete in the flesh what we began in the spirit. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their deeds follow them. Now, I am not looking for a great bloodbath in the earth.
in the day of wrath, even though there may be such a thing, because there are a lot of wicked people that seriously need to be judged, and they need to be judged with death, because their crimes are crimes against humanity, and they are crimes against God and all of God's laws that are still in force, such as do not murder and um, do not commit sexual immorality. Then I looked and behold, a white cloud and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap for the hour to reap has come. For the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. I believe that the earth is fully ripe. It is time for this reaping to begin. The man of lawlessness has been revealed. Man, man's evil has reached a, cl a climax. And if it is not stopped. If God does not stop the evil that man is now doing and, and even has planned to do to make most men into slaves for the few who would be the elite, if God does not stop it, then as Jesus prophesied in Matthew 24, no flesh would, be, would remain alive. I believe we are at that time where the man of lawlessness has become so evil and evil has become so rampant, no flesh would survive if God does not stop it. So the time has come now for the reaping of the earth. God now has to step in. He has to step in and do something about it. What we are seeing now with all of the declarations that are being made on both a national and a state level, and then in the states, even down to the county and municipal levels, we are seeing our entire society shut down. It's unprecedented. I'm 64 years old and I've never seen anything like it. It may be that things like this occurred right around the beginning of World War II, and there may be some people alive who would remember that, but we are living, living in very strange times. We don't even really know what's happening yet with this coronavirus. And that's why I read you that little blurb from Pro Project Veritas. So the time to reap has come. Then verse 17, Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire. And he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the wine press was trodden outside the city, and blood flowed from the wine press as high as a horse's bridle for 1600 stadia. Now, remember, I teach that the book of Revelation is written as an allegory. The pictures that we see for example, of Jesus returning in chapter 19 with a sword coming from his mouth by which he will strike the nations. We're not going to see Jesus with a literal sword coming out of his mouth. That's talking about the word of God, and that's how he strikes the nations. Likewise, we're not going to see blood flowing as high as a horse's bridle. Because if that were the case, the entire world would be covered with blood up to about four feet or five feet. And that's just not going to happen.
we're seeing a picture of God's judgment upon man and his ways. Upon Babylon the Great, which is the satanic kingdom, and upon the beast, which is man's kingdom. Man's kingdom has always been subject to Satan's kingdom because man was sold to Satan when man ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But Jesus redeemed man from that curse. And now we are seeing the redemption come to pass. It still remains for people to come out of Babylon because there are still some of God's people in, in Babylon. And it remains for people to not take the mark of the beast. We do that by faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord. We do that by the word of God. We do that by the washing of the water of the word. That's how we are washed. That's how we are cleansed, how we are clean, how we become clean. It's through the word. As we apply the word of God to our lives, we will not take the mark of the beast. And we will leave Babylon if we are in Babylon. So each of us has a decision to make every day. Every day. Today, if you hear God's voice, do not harden your heart as you did in the rebellion. The people of God that Moses led out of Egypt hardened their hearts at the very beginning right after they left Egypt. That was the first time that Moses struck the rock because water, they had no water. Moses struck the water and water came out and that represents the word of God. And then 40 years later, because they had to walk in the wilderness for 40 years because of their disobedience, once again, they grumbled because there was no water. And God told Moses, speak to the rock and it will bring forth water to the people. Moses did not speak to the rock. He struck the rock and lost his ability to go into the promised land. I'll tell you what that means in a minute. But both of those incidents are alluded to in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4 with respect to today if you hear God's voice. We need to be refreshed by the water of God every day. We need to drink the water. We need to let the water renew our minds and then move us by the moving of the Holy Spirit. Now Moses, some people would say that Moses was not an overcomer because he didn't get to go into the promised land because he struck the rock the second time. It's a parable again. And if you read all of the book of Hebrews, you will understand it. And it has to do with teaching the lesson that if a Christian who comes to understand the ways of God and tastes of the glory to come, turns away to the ways of the world, 
and forsakes the way of righteousness. He is, in essence, causing Christ to be sacrificed a second time. Moses striking the rock the second time is a picture of that. But it's only a picture of that. It's a parable. Moses himself is Kodeshim, one of the Kodeshim. He is a holy one. He came and spoke to Jesus on the mountain when Jesus was glorified in the flesh. Moses is great. So, the day of wrath is upon us. We don't know yet what it's going to look like. But what the scripture is showing us is that the Kodeshim are going to be glorified at this time. I believe it could be this year because we're, we're at the time now where the day of wrath is beginning and Donald Trump Even though he wants to defeat Babylon the Great, he can't do it in the flesh. It can only be done in the spirit. The Kodashim are going to be essential for bringing down Babylon the Great. Because Babylon the Great is the satanic spiritual principle that has ruled the world forever. So, we're about to see and you may not know it when you see it. I may not know it when I see it. I'm hoping to know it, but I don't know yet. The Kodashim are about to be glorified. They will be in the earth they will give protection where protection is needed in the physical. And they will also be where they are needed in the spiritual. And they will be the ones who have the power to utterly destroy Satan's kingdom. <laughs>